Okay, now we're going to be moving into section 8.4, where we're going to be working with the student t distribution. Now, up until now, we've been working solely with the z distribution, and now we're going to look at the student t distribution, which we have to use for particular unique situations. So we're going to find that much of the procedure of doing a hypothesis testing that we look at section 8.2 is going to carry over here. We're going to see a lot of that same process and indeed we're going to see that across the rest of the semester. So make sure that you're getting a good anchor on section 8.2. Um, now that we're looking into at the student t distribution though, uh, we're going to find that this is another version that we get to use, similar to how we use the z distribution for solving problems. And you've got the example of, you can see your, the t distribution table you're going to be using is on page 586 in your book. Now the student t distribution was developed by William Gossett. Uh, he was in charge of doing quality assessment at the Guinness Brewery and was looking for a way of assessing the probability of uh, rejecting a bad batch of beer it was below the, the uh, quality level that Guinness wanted to ship out, but he was often using very small sample sizes. So the Z distribution table was not um, a good match for what he needed to do. So using statistics and mathematical theorems, he built the T distribution table that we use today. At that time, Guinness Brewery had restrictions on what people could publish while they were working there, and so he published the t-distribution under the pseudonym of student. So it was a student, so it's called the student t-distribution table. Now, when we're going to use the student t-distribution table, uh, we have a couple of criteria that we have to look at first. Um, it needs to be a continuous random variable, uh, it needs to be something that's measured, okay? Um, we need to have a population that's normally distributed, or we need to have an n greater than or equal to 30. So why would we need an n greater than or equal to 30 to make a difference? What's the underlying rule that says that that's uh, enough of a criteria even if our population is not normally distributed? Well, it's going to be the central limit theorem. As we looked at with the exercises, we saw that even if you were using a skewed distribution and you were doing a sample size of n or greater, what you got began to become close to a normal distribution, so we would be able to still use these distribution tables. So that's our central limit theorem coming into play. Now, when we're looking at student t distribution, if you take a look at that, you're going to see that you need some different pieces of information to use the t distribution table. It is laid out differently than the z table. So, of course, we're going to need our alphas we looked at before, so that's our significance level, so that's the same. Um, however, what we get different here is when we have our degrees of freedom. So our degrees of freedom here is going to be n minus 1. Now, one of the concepts that's sometimes difficult to grasp for working with the, Z distribu the T distribution table um, and as we go forward looking at the Pearson and other distribution tables is why we use an N minus 1. Why are we not just using the N? Why not just use the sample size? The reason for that is because the degrees of freedom literally refers to the freedom to vary, the number of variables that are free to vary. So we're going to take a segue here to uh, look at the reasoning behind degrees of freedom as equal to n minus 1. And we're going to take a look at that first looking at a non-statistics analogy to get some kind of get the concepts in our mind and then move forward and go back and apply it to a data analysis problem. Um, now, a lot of the idea from this I actually got from a mini tab blog um, by Patrick Runkle. Um, Understanding degrees of freedom and the rationale behind it without getting into mathematical and statistical theorems is actually pretty difficult, um, and that concept is way beyond what we want to do in this class. So um, I found Patrick did a really great job of developing an analogy, and so pulled a lot of stuff from him. So let's go through this analogy that he built. So we're going to start with the idea here, completely away from statistics that you are in fact uh, a lover of unique hats. So you have a total of seven hats. As you can see down below, here's your seven hats, quite unique. Your goal is to wear a different hat each day of the week. Okay, so that is your goal. And we can see if we think about this on day one, you can choose to wear any one of the seven hats. In fact, uh, you know, so you have all, it's full, free to vary across all seven options. You can use any one of the seven hats. Okay, but on day two, now, your constraint that you have given your goal of wearing a different hat each day of the week and having um, and looking at having seven days in the week, uh, we see that you can now only choose between six hats, not all seven. And this will go so forth until on day seven, when you, um, given your constraints, you have to wear the last remaining hat. So, when we're looking at this, we see that in fact, on the last day, 
you did not have a choice in what hat to wear given the constraints and your goal that hat was already predetermined for you so if we think of those seven days as your n or your sample size um, on your last day you did not have a choice about which hat to wear right so it was predetermined or in statistical terms it was not free to vary it had no fluidity involved it was a predetermined choice so if we were looking at this and applying this to the degrees of freedom uh, formula we could see here that we would say for our degrees of freedom for this particular activity will be 7 minus 1 or equal to 6 because that last day it was predetermined for you okay now this is not an exact numerical match but it is a good analogy to kind of get the concepts about the freedom to vary here looking at a non stats problem okay and so next we're going to move on and we're going to look at it applying it to a statistical problem so now let's go back and look at our data analysis now that we've kind of got this analogy with the hats let's go look at this with numbers so in our numerical problem we have a sample with 10 values so we have an n equals 10 now if you're not estimating anything there's no constraints on this and then variables are free to vary at any value however we're going to want to test a population mean. That's the kind of test we're looking at um, for section 8.4 as a one sample t-test. So we're testing a population mean. As soon as you begin with that step of saying you want to test a population mean, you now have a constraint upon your problem. Okay, and that is the population mean itself. So remembering the definition of a mean, if the, um, the mean is equal to the sum of all of the values divided by n, right? So that means when we're, when we're looking at this particular criteria, um, we could say n, uh, we can say that our mean mu equals uh, whatever the sum of all the values are divided by n. Okay. We also can say that the sum equals whatever our n is. In this case, we're setting it at 10 times our mu. It's the same formula. It means the same thing, but we've changed the order a little bit to where we're solving for the sum. So in this problem. If we have mu equals 3.5, right, let's say that that's the population mean um, that we're testing in this particular problem, then we can see in our hypothetical situation where we've got a sample size of 10, we have a population mean of 3.5, we're constrained by having to have all of our variables sum to 35. All right, that is the constraint that we now have upon this problem as soon as we've decided we want to test a population mean. All right, and that's where that constraint comes from. This mean, the mean for this acts as a constraint in the same way that the number of days worked as a constraint in our hat selection. Okay, so it's the same type of constraint. And this is a core concept. The mean acting as a constraint upon the sample. Okay, the values of the sample. Um, so just as we had the days of the week, uh, act as a constraint for our hypothetical hat um, analogy. Now my population mean that I'm testing acts as a constraint. So let's take a look at how this plays out in actual numbers. So keep in mind we've got our sample. The first value could be anything. It's fully free to vary. It can be any value whatsoever. Okay. So here's two examples, both of these would work. And keep in mind, actually in our problem, we would say that each of the nine values could be any value at all. They are fully free to vary, they can be anything. So example one here, which has a range from negative 92 up to positive 99, um, that example is on track that it could wind up meeting our criteria of having a sum of all the values equaling 35. Similarly, example number two, we're here, we're working with very small decimal points. Uh, we don't have positive and negative, so we have very small values all the way across, is on track. It also, it could potentially meet our final criteria of having a sum of 35. However, across, the, they can be anything at all. We can generate any, any random numbers for those nine values. However, now when we get to our last value for each example, it is constrained because that last value must bring that the sum of all of those subsequent nine values plus the tenth value must equal what we would get with a mean of 35, uh, 3.5, right? So if I've got a mean of 3.5 and I've got my n size of 10, then all of my values must sum to 35. That's 
required by the definitions of what a mean is. And again, this comes into play because we're now testing a population mean. So here we can see an example number one. We have all these different variables. The 10th value must equal 61.3. It has to. It has to be 61.3 or it will not, the variables will not sum up to our required amount of 35. Similarly, in example two, the 10th value must equal 30.5. Again, it has to equal 30.5 if the total value of all of the samples is going to eat, meet our criteria of 35. So for any set of n values, right, for at whatever n, with a criteria of some population parameter, now here we're using means, we're using our mu, but keep in mind that we could do this for a proportion, we could do this for a standard deviation, okay? In any of those cases, it's going to have a degrees of freedom of n minus 1 because that last variable is not free to vary. It is constrained by meeting to make sure that the rest of the sample meets the criteria set by the uh, population parameter that we are testing. So. This is a difficult concept to get. If you need to go back and watch through this lecture, again, go watch through this problem, take some time and process it yourself so that you're clear about understanding how we get our degrees of freedom. This is very important that you understand the underlying concepts. If you solve it simply by rote, because this is what I've told you, then when you get to a unique problem, you're not gonna be able to solve that unique problem. That's the problem with learning something by rote. You can only solve exactly what you've been taught um, you want to be able to understand the underlying concepts of the degrees of freedom, why it has the constraint on the end of it of having to be n minus 1, right, because that last variable is in fact not free to vary. You need to understand that yourself so that when you have other unique situations that you come into or you have a unique problem, you can be able to logically solve that problem yourself by thinking through what would you need to be your degrees of freedom for that particular type of problem. Because yes, not all of your degrees of freedom is always going to be n minus 1. Okay, so that brings us back to understanding our degrees of freedom problem and how it's going to be n minus 1. Uh, the next video is going to take you through uh, looking at a little bit more at the distributions for the table. And then we're going to be moving in looking at whether the direction of the particular uh, distribution.